Uh, hello, uh, my name is Sajan. Uh, so this is, I suppose, the last talk of the day. So thank you for uh, staying. Uh, I, I think it'll be pretty obvious by the end of this talk that you made a mistake, but you know, thank you. I, I do appreciate it. Um, so this is a slightly different talk, perhaps, than uh, what we've heard, I, I think, at least the, the talks I've heard throughout the day, in that it's, it, it's not about any particular cloud technology where sort of I come along and say, well, this is how I've used it, and thus something. Uh, it's actually more uh, a personal almost story of, uh, as a small startup, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, we started building a streaming system. Uh, we started using Go, uh, which uh, I don't know how many of you attended uh, this morning's uh, presentation on Go. Go Pat, anybody? Yeah, a, a few people, super. Um, so basically, this you, you, for those who intend in that, you can think of this um, presentation something like you know, Go considered harmful when deployed in large scale systems. Um, hopefully, no one from Google here to kill me. But uh, and then, uh, how many of you work in streaming systems or have experience sort of building streaming systems? Super! Oh my! Well, awesome! Because this talk is really about the problems we encountered, some of the solutions we have come up as a team. But certainly, uh, I, I'm 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 sure that all of you in the audience will probably have better ideas. So without further ado, um, this is a small overview. So we'll just to get everybody on the same kind of playing field, uh, define a little bit what we mean by a streaming system, uh, define a little bit what we mean by a process calculi concurrency languages, which is what Go and Rust are, uh, and then effectively our solution to how to deal with the fact that those languages, in our opinion, uh, at least in my opinion, I should say, uh, are a little bit too low level when it comes to handling uh, something like, say, 1,000 Go routines, a million Go routines, when you have Kubernetes failures, when you have network failures. So that's, uh, that's really, and I'm not here to convince you that the, what we call declarative concurrency, and I'll, and I'll spend a little bit of time on why I'm, what I mean by that, is the right solution, but I hope it will uh, it at least g give you a glimpse of where we moved. So a streaming system. Um, I think this is a, the most general definition I could think of. Uh, the emphasis here is really on the infinite stream of events. Uh, so we have some infinite stream of events. We have a transformation function that operates on an event or potentially on a, on a set of events and then produces another infinite stream. The, the, what I like about uh, uh, sort of streaming system is this, this notion of the infinite. Uh, in other words, an event could be a tweet. Uh, so something as simple as a tweet, and a transformation function could be something very simple like, uh, I don't know, sentiment analysis, right? Is this a hateful tweet or is this a loving tweet? Something silly. Uh, on the other hand, you could think of uh, better things, like you could say something like, well, I'd like to classify people who tweet. Uh, so in that sense, you now need to collect tweets from those people but it might get a little more complicated. You might say, well, actually, I'd like to understand a person as embedded into his own community, so I need to collect tweets from his friends. And this is where this limited external memory comes in. Some streaming systems are called semi-streaming systems. Uh, the idea is that you have an external memory, typically, sort of people say limited, meaning that the space given to that memory is something of a log-log space, right? In other words, you can't just really have as much memory as you like. But in principle, this, this sort of covers a, a, a simple streaming, or uh, I think as complex streaming systems as they get. Um, my background, if um, just to indulge me a little bit, just because I think in this talk I will, you will see that I'm very biased in, in everything I say. So this is where the bias comes from. Um, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a, a young, uh, naive, I want to say, computer scientist, I was uh, part of Imperial College in London. Uh, they're known for their um, AI uh, group. Uh, I think now they call themselves machine learning because it's cool. Uh, but I spent, within that group, I spent a lot of time thinking about non-monotonic reasoning. So how does a system make a decision based on assumptions knowing that it will be wrong in the future? So in other words, you have to hedge your bets effectively. And this, this kind of, these processes, uh, pretty much would draw me to, uh, to streaming systems. I, I moved to ETH Zurich, which is a small university in Switzerland, and uh, within the group there, and with uh, lots of help from Google in Switzerland, we, I started investigating streaming systems. And I spent a lot of time thinking about these things, such as, for example, um, I don't know if you've uh, heard of Google Spanner database, so they have a, a particularly interesting database where timestamps are not precise. So by default, they tell you, we don't actually know when this happened. So in other words, whatever you're operating on, you're always potentially making mistakes. Uh, similarly, we had projects where, for example, you might say, 
well, log monitoring is very interesting, right? Uh, but what happens when you lose data? So it's gone, somebody, somebody deleted, let's say a nefarious sector. Uh, can you make any kind of decisions? So, and I thought that was it, like I was really into it. Um, I moved here uh, and I, 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 uh, I co-founded a small startup, it's called SignalFrame, and, and then I started building a streaming system. So in the past I used to reason about them and kind of come up with cool and fancy algorithms, and then I started building one. Um, so today, just to give you some sense of what we do, um, we collect wireless signals uh, from various devices such as Fitbits cars, routers, um, and we build security products. Um, currently, our streaming platform takes in about 10, more than 10 billion events per day, though our distribution is, is very skewed. So at some points, we might take 5 billion uh, events per two hours, and we sort of have to cater for that. Um, we are a streaming graph platform, uh, so vertices are devices, and then events uh, effectively denote temporal relationships between these devices. So what we do and what we have to do in streaming is sort of understand the device as it's embedded in its environment. Um, you can think of this as, as building sort of a word to vec representation from where people say, you know, a word such as king is not its syntactic property such as k-i-n-g, but rather the fact that it's embedded in a cloud of other words. So we do that for, uh, if you like, wireless signals. Um, so one thing that we tend to be decent, I suppose, that or we're trying to be good at is uh, detecting uh, mobile fraud. Uh, we can detect things like SIM hijacking, bot farms, and so forth based on this. But that's not point of this, uh, of this talk, uh, really. Uh, the point is to say we have to, by necessity, deal with large amounts of data, and we have to do it quickly, build models very, very quickly in order to make pseudo real-time decisions. So we looked around for um, different streaming platforms uh, to basically implement our graph analytics. Um, I'm, and I'm sure all of you uh, have come across sort of uh, Spark streaming, Flink. Uh, there's the, the one that Google open sourced as well. Um, we didn't quite feel comfortable using them because it, we kind of figured that by the time we are actually experts at using them at that scale, uh, we will just run out of money. Um, so being cocky um, as a team, we sort of said, okay, well, let's, let's build one. Like, how hard can it be? And that's why I'm here crying, because it's hard. Uh, but in, in particular, what we decided on, and, and this is not, I think, the similar architecture to Heron, uh, which is Twitter's streaming framework, if, if, if anybody came across it. Um, uh, we have, uh, if you like, two processes in, in the system. Uh, one are called dealers, the other ones are called players. So dealers, uh, their main mission in life, if you like, is to take in some event and figure out which of the players is supposed to do something with it. So in other words, they don't really transform an event, uh, they merely find that it's sync while it's the players' processes who are really the ones doing the hard lifting. So you can think of it if we are talking about tweets, then a dealer would basically pick up a tweet, uh, figure out what, who is it's coming from, which community that belongs to, and then say, well, which player is sort of assigned to deal with a particular community, and then shoot it off. Now that player gets it and does whatever the hell the player does. It might go get more history, it might just do a very simple analysis, it might do simple things like counting. And then finally, uh, each player then is allowed to produce more events. So it can say, well, okay, I've, I've for example, uh, calculated something and I push it out. Um, YouTube views, if you like, uh, works in a similar system in a sense that every time you click on something, you generate an event, uh, which is start video. When you pause or when you stop, that's another event. And then basically those two events combined is a new output event that goes into Google billing. I think, I don't know, I don't actually know that it works this way, but I would imagine. Um, so in, in a sense, the streaming systems tend to be, in my opinion, relatively, at a very high level, they're relatively simple, right? It, it's not, uh, the, like the previous talks were much more complicated. Um, in a, so all the dealer does, we can describe it with relatively simple terms. So you have an input stream, you'd like to transform that input stream. The transformation is usually some sort of a mapping. So for each, and this is really functional programming mapping, you take an event, you apply something here, we're hashing an event to, because uh, for most of the time, players live in on, on a hash ring, so you figure out where it falls on the ring and you push it to that player. 
Uh, there's a, always a transport involved. So transport here could be something relatively simple, like, well, resolve a client and give it to the, your network client. And then effectively, you just put them together. So you say, I have a Kafka source. Uh, I transform that, and I transport it. That's, that's pretty much what a dealer does. Player, similarly, uh, the only trick in player, as we said, uh, it could be the case that it needs to collect many more. So the mapping on player from taking that event and producing something could be more involved, so it might have to reduce over certain events. Uh, but then, again, it just has a transport, and off we go. So from development requirements, this, I think, at least in our opinion, this sort of kind of captures it, right? Uh, we can pretty much describe most of our graph computations using these relatively primitive tools. Um, now, granted, the graph, if you like, streaming algorithms that we implement are not that complicated, but this kind of captures it. What I failed to appreciate when I was young and naive was, and just as a side note, I, I think you can see how this kind of now grows because each one of those now becomes a node in your, in your particular pipeline and in just uh, uh, chain pipelines together. But that's not so interesting. Uh, what is more interesting is the operating environment. So we, being a, a very poor startup, of course, try to maximize resources. So we uh, deploy into Kubernetes, uh, trying to sort of stack as many pods as you can, um, which is OK, but it does come with uh, certain operating problems, such as, well, you run out of memory, for example, on a, on a Kubernetes pod, and you kill that instance, or you kill the even worse, you kill Kubernetes on that instance, and suddenly you have effectively a dead machine. Uh, what do you do? Uh, do you kill the stream? Uh, do you buffer that somewhere, somewhere? But if you're processing something like 1 billion events in that hour, no, drop it, because that data will probably come in again. Um, so there, there are some decisions that we've hidden away from a relatively simplistic, say, view of what to do with events. Now we're talking about, well, what happens in, in failures? Um, CPU starvation happens a lot, uh, so suddenly, you see a drop in throughput because one other guy on our, on, on our team thought it was a really, really good idea to deploy a new service onto these instances and suddenly just kills the throughput. Um, again, the, how, do, how does one deal with this is hidden away from a simple transformation, but becomes 50% of the operating time. Um, the, so ideally, the, we now have not only sort of the uh, if you like, the uh, requirements on how to express the computation, which um, I thought was the hard part, but rather we have the operating requirements, which is, well, how does the system react to these changes? Uh, one thing here that we've learned um, is ability to control the concurrency. Uh, so if you've heard uh, this morning's talk, it, it, uh, it sort of said, well, you can launch one million Go routines. It's not really a problem. And, and I agree with that statement if it's counting numbers, but if you launch one million Go routines and they all, for example, read from Kafka, you, you've just killed that server. So there is something to be said for, yes, the, for example, uh, processes are cheap, but not necessarily the resources those processes uh, um, come across. Prioritize execution. Um, again, if you launch, let's say, 10,000 routines, and one of those routines is responsible for your, uh, for example, uh, checking the, uh, the liveness then suddenly, and you have four cores, then if you do the maths, right, you, you get a very low probability of that, of that process, which arguably is the most important one in your system, being ever executed, because you're processing so many events. Um, cancellations, so when you deploy a new version of your, of your system, then you need to tear down everything. And it turns out that tearing down and canceling uh, highly concurrent servers, stupidly hard. Uh, and, and I think we've come a long way, but we certainly are not there yet. So uh, I, I guess you see where I'm going with this. If, uh, you know, if there's one thing I've learned over the past few years is that uh, the streaming systems problem is, is really focused on how to structure a system uh, that reasons over incomplete and infinite data. And by structuring here is really that how does one take in what is a relatively simple computation and then also cater for its operating requirements. Uh, and I hope you agree with me. So now, now we come to the, to the gist of it, which is, well, if one wants to build this, then um, what are your options? Um, and us, uh, sort of, we decided to, given that we know it's a highly concurrent system, then let's focus on, um, and, and I call them here uh, process calculi languages, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, 
so we wanted something where concurrency, uh, if you like, primitives are there built into the language because we, we understood that concurrency is our issue here. So um, uh, process calculi, I, in, in case uh, 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 anybody wonders, it's, uh, it describes a, a family of formal languages for dealing with computations. As a famous one is CSP, uh, or Communicating Sequential Processes, which Go language is based on. And other ones are PyCalculus, MuCalculus. There are many of them, but the main thing that they sort of expose is to say you should think of your computation as a, as a set of processes, channels, and messages. Um, Rust, um, I, and I'm sure you've heard of Rust, it sort of follows a similar pattern. Though interestingly, um, the, the support for channels and messages in Rust comes through a library as opposed to Go. Um, I'm not sure what that says about Rust de developers, whether they, they think it's good or bad, but there you go. Um, and of course, we went with Go um, when we made that decision. Uh, Go had much, much better driver support. Uh, for example, uh, it had a native Cassandra um, drivers, which was important for us because we built our graph database on top of Cassandra. So that, that helped. Um, but in, in all honesty, it really came down to sort of which drivers and, and how mature the language was at a time. So I consider Go and Rust sort of in this particular talk as interchangeable. Um, and then the, 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 I suppose the, the question I should have asked myself, but I didn't, uh, was is such primitives, are they good abstractions for building these kind of systems? Um, I suppose we were just uh, a, little bit, a little bit naive, or, and, and I think we overestimated just you know, how good we are, because it turns out we're, we're kind of OK programmers, certainly not 10Xs. Um, but for those who, uh, who, who were uh, at, this, uh, at this morning's talk, uh, this, is a, this might sound uh, a little bit boring, but for the rest of you, here's just a, a small overview of Go's concurrency, and I think Rust follows very similarly. And, and the point here is not to actually teach you, but just to showcase some of the issues you might start running into. Um, so I'll, I'm going to talk about this from the point of you are building a streaming system. So typically in your node, be it dealer or player in our case, you, you generally accept that there is an input stream. Uh, and you probably have some producers that read it from someone, let's say Kafka. They push it to some consumers that are supposed to calculate its address and so forth. Um, so naturally, one sh or, or we sort of adopted the, the, the position that we should just, well, embrace Go's primitives to do this. Uh, so here's, here's one attempt. Um, we can define a Go function. So Go here uh, is a keyword that says, take this anonymous function and effectively turn it into, an, into a process. Uh, the process here takes some input channel. Uh, a channel, you can think of it as a, uh, basically a, a FIFA queue and range over it. Whenever you read something from it, uh, find the address of where it's supposed to go, pick that channel. So somebody, somebody, let's say, writing to the network will be listening on that channel and push your event into it. Fairly simple. Uh, on the other hand, here we have consumers. Uh, we start 10 consumers. Why 10? Who knows? Um, the channels have a little bit of buffer to allow for variations in, in throughput, but in principle, they are also very simple. They just range over that channel, and for example, in this particular case, they count. So this looks super. Um, and of course, the, the, the issues come in when you put it in production. Uh, things can pop out. So first of all, the, a possible trace, of course, is the one we expect. You count event one and event two, and, and it all's dandy. Um, however, this code, and not through any fault of Go per se, can also deadlock, uh, because you don't actually know what happens in the count. So even though, as a, if you like, as a, uh, a person who wrote a, um, a streaming process, now you have to understand that what happens if something that you use deadlocks, in other words, blocks. Because here, if count doesn't actually uh, finish executing, the channel on the producer will eventually block. And because it's just ranging here, it will fill up the buffer of channel and then just wait. Because in Go, the semantics, like other process calculi languages, the, the channels are blocking. And there's a specific reason for that. They will block. Um, however, in, when we think about streams, that's typically not how we think. We always think that there are possibilities of blocks. There are possibilities of throughputs. So you need to have effectively statements to say what happens in those cases. These languages don't really address that issue. Uh, 
um, we could try to make it a little bit better. Uh, so we could say, well, actually, why don't we spawn a process for every event, right? Go routines are cheap. So in that way, I can only block one Go routine, and then I can deal with that maybe later. I can cancel that Go routine. The problem here is we don't know what the, how slow the count function is, so we might end up in cases where we just spawn thousands of these little Go routines on, on your left. Now, it's not the case that the system will necessarily die, but you will get to a very low throughput because you will have starved the Go runtime of effectively uh, uh, CPU because what it ends up doing is basically circling around all those events trying to find something you can execute. Again, it's not the fault of the language, and this is not a critique of the language per se. It's just that we are putting in, in, in a slightly different operating environment than what channels and Go routines are meant for. The only trick there is, of course, this is, this is not something that's wildly communicated. So we went down this path. Um, Cancelling uh, turns out to be really important. Uh, and it's, I, I would say if there is one critique, perhaps, of the language, I would say that cancellation in Go uh, come through a library and not inside the language. We create um, a few issues. So one way to cancel in Go, if you like, is uh, to pass in this uh, uh, library or use this library, I think it originally from Google, called Context. Uh, context is something that can be canceled. Uh, if it's canceled, then the channel done here will, will, uh, will eventually signal. The problem here is select. Uh, so select is non-deterministic in Go, uh, which, again, it's according to the semantics. However, what does that mean? That means that I, there are possible worlds where I will have canceled the context, yet this function will keep on operating for the next 10,000 events. It's very low probability. However, when you deploy it in production and you process one billion events, it will happen. Meaning that it, there are cases when you cancel things and you kind of wait. Now, that waiting, uh, typically when you cancel things, you'd like them to cancel very, very quickly. You don't cancel for nothing. If you suddenly start canceling very slowly, that means you're building up back pressure somewhere in your system. Um, oh, by the way, so one way of potentially dealing with it is to go around the language. So every time now I process something, I will break out, check that first, and then run in. And again, it's not that it can't be done, but clearly now for something that what we care about and should be very simple, we're spending a lot of time uh, with, let's call it boiler, boilerplate code. So to summarize this part, I, I, I suppose all I really, really want is a channel transformation. Right? I, I want to say that I have a channel of, 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 uh, of a certain type, and I want to generate a channel of another type. That's really all I'm trying to say. Ideally, I would also say something, uh, or I would declare things like, well, this is how many Go routines you have for this particular transformation. If it's too slow, you might go up a little bit in the bound, but that's it. Otherwise, start shutting down the process. Um, I would also be, like to be able to not care how other libraries are implemented. In particular, when you import libraries into Go, if they panic, they crash your process. Um, so if you have a Go, one Go routine out of your 10 million that panics, it will crash your whole binary. Not ideal, uh, especially when you're dealing with external libraries. Um, and then prioritizing executions. Ideally, you'd want your cancellations, if they come through, to take precedence over whatever else you are doing. Now, again, I, 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 this is really important. I'm not criticizing the language. Uh, this, uh, in other words, I'm not picking on Go or Rust for that matter. But once you end up in this position, um, what are our options? So some options, and then kind of what we as a team, as a company sort of said, well, we, we think that these primitives are not right for us. Uh, so one option was, of course, well, let's ignore that. And let's make every developer that joins our team now learn all these intricate ways of canceling, intricate ways of dealing with blocks or blocking channels. Um, let's make sure all that's great. Uh, now, unfortunately, we, we don't have such uh, a, a sort of a programmers that, that can think uh, along you know, thousands of lines of code and make sure that it's definitely, definitely not blocking. Um, so we decided to take a slightly different route, um, which is well, let's build abstractions. Uh, in other words, let's move away from the notions of Go routines, let's move away from notions of channels, and build new abstractions that are more suited for our streaming tasks. 
Um, so I, I cheekily call it uh, declarative concurrent programming, mostly because uh, I, quite, I, I like the generic notion of what declarative programming is. It's, uh, if, if, I, if I may summarize it this way, uh, it says what the computation is, not how you manage it. Um, in fact, I think uh, um, the gentleman that was talking about the uh, Firebase, in, in his code, whenever you see something like on do this or do this, he's effectively specifying a state machine. That state machine effectively is your declarative programming concept. In other words, you're not saying uh, launch this first, then do this. You're just saying, well, events will come into your system, and then based on what event is there, you pick the code to execute. Um, so uh, and, and there, uh, there is a, a very strong bias here. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I, I used to do a lot of prologue. Uh, it was popular back in the days for uh, uh, decision tree programs. So, and, and that's a very declarative programming language where you sort of specify um, um, what, what, what kind of queries, what kind of answers you're looking for, and then you let the internal procedure sort of uh, try and, and, and learn what, what the answer is. Great days. Um, so this is our, let's call it work in progress, because uh, we're, not, we're never quite happy. But this is what we have at the moment. Um, so we have a, a management layer uh, built directly on top of Go. Uh, this is, it contains job runners uh, and, and contains a Go safe. And I'll, I'll go into some details there. Uh, they, there's a new data structure layer. Uh, here I'll talk about streams. Uh, and then we have a declarative layer where we effectively have um, MapReduce over streams. Uh, we also have some futures, uh, but I'll, I'll focus mostly on MapStream. There's going to be a lot of code for the next few slides. And um, the, I, I hope what that code will give you is that we, one does have to go through a lot of pain in the very low levels. Uh, yet, when you get to the declarative layers, then it kind of pays off. So let's see if, if you would agree with me. Uh, so first of all, we, we banned Go uh, as a keyword. Um, so we said, if you use Go, we will shoot you. Um, the, the reason for that is we wanted to add a few bells and whistles that we thought were important, at least in our context, which is what happens when, a, when the anonymous function you're working on fails. Right? Uh, and that can happen, uh, for example, badly formatted event. One option is you restart it. Uh, one option is you restart up to a certain failure level. Because at some point, you always expect your things to fail. Right? There is, there's always going to be an event that kind of goes, huh, weird. However, if that failure rate grows, uh, especially, say, in the first one hour of your deployment, you have a bug. So there are a few intricacies there. And then finally, you, you launch it. Uh, and, and the code is actually fairly stupidly simple. Um, the exceptions here is we built our own uh, exceptions library in Go in order to cater for this. Go doesn't really come with exceptions, uh, so you can ignore that. But here you can see that it, effectively we are just hiding the, the, the Go function we executed, but then we say if anything goes bad, like panics and so forth, then invoke the exception handler and then deal with it and potentially restart it. The job runner then becomes a, a, a little bit more complex, but not actually that much. Uh, so a job runner, um, you can think of it, it it's actually a, a fairly simple worker pool that I'm sure you've seen elsewhere. But you can give it some bounds, or you can leave it unbounded if, you, if you're feeling lucky. Um, the idea there is that if, if you can't run it because you don't have enough resources, push it onto a queue. Uh, this queue is non-blocking, so we will never block there. Uh, you might run out of memory because of this, uh, but there are ways that we can, we can deal with that. And then finally, uh, we launch a safe Go routine. Uh, the only trick here is Go actually prefers you to launch many Go routines as opposed to keeping a Go routine that just reads from somewhere. Um, it, I think it had, I, I'm not sure we empirically established that. There is, uh, we didn't find anything in, in, in Go's internals that would suggest that, but it seems to be the case. So we wrote the job runner with that in mind. Um, and in particular, that's why there is this defer, which just means execute after everything else, which is check and drain, meaning that once this Go routine finishes, make sure that the queue is empty. If it's not empty, start a new Go routine. Um, the, the trick here is that you might end up in, in very odd synchronization pr uh, uh, problems where something puts something onto a queue, but everything else finishes running, and then nobody picks it up. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it is, is, is not that it's an uh, unsolvable problem, but at, at the job runner level, we'd like to deal with these things. So the rest of the stack doesn't really care. It just executes things. 
Uh, stream is the new um, uh, our function. Um, if, if you like, the, there isn't really anything uh, too particularly special about it. Um, what it does, it, it, it takes is this queue, which is a non-blocking queue. In other words, um, what, oh, I got 10 minutes, super. Um, I, it, it's, uh, it, it basically adds things to the queue. Um, you, you can put a block on it, and then you can define what happens if you can't push onto a queue. So these are lossy streams. Uh, sometimes lossy streams are fine. Uh, the only trick here is there are a bunch of cancels here. Um, the, what we decided to do is to give different ways of dealing with streams. So one way of dealing with a stream is to say end the stream, meaning no more production onto the stream, but you let the readers drain it. On the other hand, you can also cancel a stream, meaning uh, just kill everything. In other words, no more produce, if whatever you had on a stream is lost. Uh, this means we, we are very quick. Um, the, uh, this is, uh, if you like, a produce. Uh, so we are using those internals clear, clearly here. We're using selects. Uh, we're using context cancellations. But we've hidden these patterns away, because uh, it, it is our opinion that these patterns shouldn't be something that everybody has to know and then copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. So we're just hiding them internally uh, into a new data structure. Consuming is, is relatively simple. Uh, the only trick here is uh, when um, we're using uh, weight conditions in, in Go as well. Uh, it's, it's one of the um, uh, concurrency primitives it has that I, I don't think was mentioned this morning. But uh, in case you're wondering, it does have it. And then this is it, um, uh, the, final, the final piece, which is MapReduce. Uh, so first, what we do is uh, this is patterns in background, just starts uh, a, a Go, safe Go routine in the background, and it gives it a very high priority. And here, um, this is actually uh, a, a very simple um, uh, connected uh, components algorithm. So we have ranging over clusters, producing them onto the stream. And then this is our. Um, computation over the stream. So we have two functions. One of them is map. One of them is reduce. If, if you've ever worked with map reduce, this, this looks stupidly simple. Um, and that was the idea, is to actually now make our streaming processing really just these two slides, and not worry about how to cancel things, how to make sure that we consume, how to make what happens when we have lossy uh, or, or high, high throughput. Um, so that's really it. Uh, I, I suppose, in, in summary, personal note, uh, streaming systems are difficult to build, uh, and, and we certainly um, fail. Uh, but I, I think we pick ourselves up relatively well. Um, the, I, I still believe by this notion that uh, highly concurrent processes are needed to deal with massive uh, number of events, especially if you're resource constrained and you don't want to pay AWS uh, a pound of flesh. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the standard primitives, I hope I've convinced you, are perhaps too low level. Uh, the declarative primitives we kind of like, and they seem to yield stable systems. We haven't had major issues. Um, so it has paid off, but uh, it, it's, it's certainly the case that we're still learning. We, we're still not convinced that, if you like, this particular set of abstractions is the right one. Um, we're constantly revising ourselves. Um, but uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, finally, I, I am just a part of team. There are uh, other three guys who do much more than me, uh, so uh, ma massive thanks to them as well. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I, I suppose we do have time for questions, if, if I'm not. Oh, super. Sure. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Uh, so the question is, um, are we uh, borrowing, recreating a lot from uh, Elixir, which is a language built on top of Erlang, and in particular, Erlang OTP libraries? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, um, in, in, uh, Erlang is, a, is an interesting language, though. It uh, doesn't quite fall under process calculi. It has a different uh, concurrency model, which we didn't really feel comfortable with. Uh, but certainly, the OTP libraries uh, are, are something that inspired me um, a lot. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Erlang is, is yet another uh, highly uh, concurrent language. But you generally don't program in Erlang. You always program in OTP, which is a set of libraries that deals with process creation, process termination, uh, and various patterns in, in distributed programming.
Uh, sure. Uh, we didn't go down the JVM route um, because we thought we, we just, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, we did we we thought we would run out of time in uh, on JVM tuning and that we would spend more time there rather than kind of focusing on our own stuff. And I, I'm I'm not sure that was a good decision that we made, but it was. We felt uh, we felt that it was it would be easy if we controlled the whole stack, given our particular problem of, of graph computations. Um, any more questions? Well, you've been the best audience ever, so thank you.